Welcome to a Stuart Beam engine restoration, this one is part two. Continuing the inspection to assess the condition of the engine. With very fine adjustments to the valve timing in the first episode, I managed to get the engine to run without making much noise at a low speed. And here, once again, I'm making some minute adjustments to improve the valve timing. Some viewers may be thinking, well, this is okay, why do you need to do any work on it? The reason for this will slowly unfold during the series. The good news is, I contacted the owner of the engine and I've got the job of repairing it. I'm going to start the job by packing the glands. The stuffing glands on the cylinder and the steam chest are designed to prevent steam leaks from around the piston rod and the valve rod. But on this one, there didn't seem to be much in the way of packing in either of them. This clip shows me packing the gland using some Teflon coated yarn. I use Teflon coated yarn these days because I do not like the modern graphited yarn. I think the old type of graphited yarn that we all know and love probably contained asbestos, so that's why it was changed. When you pack stuffing glands on steam engines, if you use too much graphited yarn, the gland nut, or in this case the gland flange, needs to end up in the right position. For two reasons, the length of the bolts, Plus, if the top part of the gland nut is too high, it's going to collide with the part on the end of the piston rod. That's why you've just seen me unwind part of the gland packing and cut it off with a pair of cutters. To hold this flange in place, I'm fitting some proper studs. I can't be doing with the small bolts, they just don't look right. These are genuine Stuart studs and are designed for the job, as you can see. The secret of successful gland packing is to first of all wind the correct amount of yarn around the piston rod or the valve rod and when you tighten the gland, tighten it fully, and then back off each of the nuts a very small amount. If you put too much pressure on the gland packing, in turn the gland packing will put too much pressure on the piston rod, and this, believe it or not, will score the metal of the piston rod, owing to there being too much friction between the piston rod and the valve packing. Also, don't forget that these studs are only 7BA, so you mustn't put too much pressure on them when you're tightening the nuts, otherwise they will shear off. As you've just seen on screen, I finished the job, I ran the engine and poured some oil around the top of the flange and it didn't leak. The piston rod gland was originally held in place by two small hexagon bolts and the gland on the valve chest which leaks badly is held in position using two brass dome head screws. I removed both of the screws and gently prized the flange out of the way. I would normally pack the valve chest gland once I'd removed the valve chest which I'll be doing very shortly, but I thought I would show the principle of how to pack the gland without removing the valve chest. There's not much room to work and it's quite a fiddly job. Initially, I put a small piece of gland packing in, but it wasn't enough, so I fitted a longer piece of yarn. I used quite a bit more gland packing the second time round and it still didn't work. The reason for this will be that the hole that goes through into the steam chest has been drilled too big for the diameter of the valve rod. And if I carry on adding more packing and tightening the flange, what's going to happen is the packing at the bottom will start to be forced through the gaps in the hole into the steam chest. This clip shows me temporarily refitting the dome head brass screws to see whether or not the gland packing does its job. And the best way to tell is to run the engine and apply some oil around the gland. And as you can clearly see, the oil is bubbling around the top of the gland. So this hasn't been successful and I will give it some proper attention when I dismantle the steam chest. As an experiment, I fitted even more Teflon coated yarn. Will it be okay this time? I really doubt it. As you can clearly see, it's not leaking quite as badly, but it's still not right. When using compressed air, it's very difficult to see where the leaks are coming from. When you run a steam engine on steam, it is much easier to see the leaks. In this clip you will notice as I run the engine at a higher speed, the knock comes back with a vengeance. This is not going to be a really long series like the one about rebuilding the locomotive, but there's still quite a lot of work to do. As you look at it at the moment, it sort of looks okay, but in certain areas it is far from okay. This is an old engine and some parts of the engineering are a little bit suspect so I can't really say I can get it to run magnificently, but I'll get it to run quite well and quietly. It's time to remove the steam chest cover. I've edited the nut removal to speed things up. Here you see a typical example of the law that says the last part of the job goes wrong. 
I could not shake the nut out of the nut spinner, that's why I refitted the nut to the stud so I could remove it with my hand. Once I removed the steam chest cover, this is what I found inside. A slide valve, which is not in the correct position on the valve spindle. It uncovers the port at the top fine, but it doesn't at the bottom. Part of this is to do with the operating mechanism, because the primary operating arm at the left hand side of this image is loose on the shaft. This is something that's worth remembering. You can't remove the steam chest on one of this type of Stuart beam engines with the cross shaft in position. You can remove it if you undo the left hand gun metal bearing, which allows the cross shaft to be slid out of the right hand side bearing, but I need the entire mechanism removing because it needs some work. Here's a close-up shot with the mechanism out of the way, and as you can see, the port face is in quite good condition, which is more than can be said for the valve. This middle part is supposed to be milled out to a certain depth, and like this, it's a bit uneven and a bit shallow. I'll probably do something about that. This part of the system is not good. The operating arm on the shaft wobbles about, because the bolt that originally held it in position had sheared off. To drill out this very small broken bolt, I'm using my very small drilling machine. This is a Proxon motor tool drill press, and it's a very useful thing to have in the workshop for very fine drilling operations. I do like a belt and braces approach to the job, so once I drilled out the broken bolt, I refitted the arm to the shaft using some Loctite 603. And then I used a taper reamer to ream just about all the way through, then I could fit a taper pin. The reason that I started the reamer through the smaller of the two holes in this part was because at the other side, where I drilled out the bolt, the hole was not in the right position anyway. This clip shows a taper pin that I fitted into the hole. And as you can see, where it came through the centre of the rod, it wasn't in the right position in the hole where the bolt had sheared off. This doesn't look too good, but I have a fix for this. It's called a hammer. I riveted over the taper pin to fill this hole. This next clip shows the result. After riveting, I cleaned up the part using my one inch belt sander and now it looks like this. Not perfect, but a lot better than it was. And with a combination of Loctite, a taper pin, and then riveting over the taper pin means that this arm is never going to move on this shaft again. That concludes this episode. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.